If you know what an influencer is, you can likely guess what a finfluencer is, such as the lingo for self-made social media personalities who, in the latter case, dispense all kinds of financial wisdom on platforms such as YouTube, TikTok, or even the old-fashioned ones such as Facebook. But not all advice is equal. So while it might be free advice, is it good advice? Joining us now on how to navigate these uncharted waters, we're joined in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan by Kaval Olson LePage, certified financial planner and advisory team leader with Affinity Wealth Management. And here in our studio, Siobhan Llewellyn, financial content creator and co-founder of Hiver Academy, which provides free online classes on personal finance catered towards women. Kurt Rosentretter, portfolio manager with Manual Life Securities and a certified independent financial advisor. And Jim Chong, financial content creator, coach, and co-founder of the Fat Fire Club, which offers online classes on gaining financial independence. And we're delighted to welcome all of you both here to our studio in Midtown Toronto. And Kaval, nice to have you on the line from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And why don't we start with you right away? What do you see, uh, Kaval, as the benefits of financial content creators on social media? Absolutely. I think one of the, the benefits that we're seeing is the increased engagement that um, we're seeing from our younger Canadians into having a, more of an interest into their own financial future. Um, we know that it's not something that's taught readily in schools. So the fact that they're able to access this content to maybe encourage them to do the research on their own or seek professional advice has definitely been beneficial. So is the idea you, you sort of got to go where they want you to be and they want you to be on social media these days, something as simple as that? Yeah, we do know that, you know, our millennial and Gen Z audiences are definitely more drawn to the the ease of information that's coming from TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. We like the videos. I'm an elder millennial myself. I would much prefer to watch a quick five minute video than stream through maybe a five page uh, news article. So I think it's definitely something that leans towards their tendencies. Kurt, we hear all sorts of stories about how financially illiterate so many people are in this province these days. Do you think this fills some of that gap. Absolutely it does. Uh, I would say financial literacy is still at an all-time low in every age bracket. Hmm. I teach courses across Canada. I see it all the time. So anything you can do to, you know, I think initiate some interest by the public to learn a bit about finance to make them more knowledgeable is healthy. Uh, it's just more about, you know, is it the correct advice to be giving in the first place? Well, we will get to that in a bit. Siobhan, I want you to tell us about the Hiver Academy or as we say in Quebec, the Hiver Academy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, what are you doing there? So at Hiver Academy, we developed this platform as a way to help empower women to feel like they're in the driver's seat of their own personal finance journey and to take control of their own finances and most importantly, to feel confident doing it. And, and what prompted you to do this? I think based on our own experience of two women trying to navigate the world of money and being in a situation where we felt the guilt, the shame, the judgment around trying to take control of your own finances and having that be such a barrier to taking that next step and to actually taking action or asking questions or being curious about it. And so that was the main inspiration. It started with ourselves. And quickly we realized that we are definitely not the only ones that feel this way. Maybe I'm missing something here, but what's the guilt and shame of of your personal financial situation? I think in terms of, uh, especially as a student, I carried a lot of student debt. I wasn't able to pay that off in a short amount of time. And I think with parents that are more risk averse or friends that didn't have the same situations as myself, I felt like I was digging my self into a deeper hole than I had to. And I didn't quite understand why. And it was really because I didn't have the tools, the resources, or the support network to be able to do that. And um, in joining forces with my friends and making sort of a pact to help us learn and be curious about that, it really started to snowball into this business that we have today. Gotcha. Jim, the Fat Fire Club. That does not sound like a financial literacy or a financial advisory group, but I guess, well, I guess it is. Why don't you tell us what it well, is? Well, the, the FIRE group is called Financial Independence Retire Early. I was sort of put in that bucket, even though that was not my intent. My intent was to relay my experiences investing over 30 years. I'm a Canadian that invests only in U.S. assets, U.S. real estate. 
And I started putting my information out there and people said, oh, this is like fire. This is very similar. He's not working anymore because he was able to generate uh, investment returns and cash flow. So they sort of put me in that bucket and I ran with it. And okay, and give me that acronym again, F-I-R-E. Financial Independence Retire Early is actually the acronym, but I call it Relax Early. <laughs> Relax Early, got it, okay. And what, what sort of gap in financial literacy or in financial services do you think you're filling? So my intent wasn't to fill that, that need. I was just trying to talk to how I was when I was 14 years old and I do nothing and everyone was lying to me about what could be done or what could not be done about money. I got so frustrated, I just went off on my own and started reading dozens and dozens of books, and I did it myself, and I figured out what worked, what didn't work, what are the caveats, what are the risks. Then I got onto social media, and then it just took off. I did not expect it. I got onto social media two years ago, and then all of a sudden, I'm getting five million views a month. Say that again. I'm getting five million views a month. No kidding. Yeah. Okay, good for you. All right, now I, Siobhan, back to you for a second here. I get that a guy who works for a company that's called Manulife is allowed to give financial advice. Yes. Okay, we've all heard of Manulife. <laughs> Are you legally allowed to provide financial advice? Great question. We do not provide financial advice. I think we provide financial inspiration. And What's the difference? I think the difference is that when it comes to professionals, they are the experts, they have the education, and they have the knowledge to be able to direct the decisions that you make. Where we are trying to fill a gap is to help you feel like you have the foundational concepts to even take that next step to go to a professional advisor. And I think there is quite a large gap in terms of people not feeling or not believing that they are worth having an advisor for or having a financial planner because they are so overwhelmed with their own situation. And so we're trying to inspire people to get that confidence back and make them feel like they have a seat at the table and understand the opportunities available to them so that they can dictate their own financial journeys. Okay, this is another one of these older people questions. <laughs> How do you make money at what you do? Another great question. Yeah. So we are really fortunate to be able to partner with different organizations or financial institutions to be able to help them develop content around the products or services that they have uh, and create our own review and experience of the product and to be able to relay that in a way that is accessible, approachable, and understandable to our audience so that they can not only understand what these services and products are, but understand how they can benefit from them and apply it to their own life as well. Okay, Jim, I'm gonna follow up with you on that because this is another thing I need to understand here. Again, I get how a guy from Manulife makes money. <laughs> how, do, how do people who put financial, if you don't wanna call it advice, let's call it inspiration, whatever, how, how do you, okay, you get five million views a month, how do you make money from that? So the intent at the beginning was not to make money, but I knew that with five million views a month, you could monetize it. And this is a totally different topic from financial literacy, right? right? When you have attention, this is how you generally monetize it. It goes into a landing page where you offer something of value. So maybe 10 steps to sort of reduce your expenses, something like that. People want that download, you get that download, you have their contact information, and then you start asking them, what do you want to learn about? You basically sell them what they want to know. I want to learn how to uh, invest in U.S. real estate. What did you do? What bank did you use? What mortgage did you get? What, what, pro what the states did you look at? Why did you look there? How did you find the crime statistics? And then we build what they want, and then they purchase it. All right. Now we're going to get to the other side of this, which is, Jim, in your view, is there anything, nefarious is too strong a word, but anything concerning about the business model that they've just described here, given that there are, you know, they're potentially built in conflicts of interest here. I think that, uh, Steve, the difference between, you know, influencers, you know, pushing perfume or clothing, it's not quite the same as financial services where people can really get hurt. I think if I'm a fit influencer, what I would be concerned about is credibility and liability. Credibility is things like uh, designations, experience, um, do you have professional liability insurance if someone sues you? Who's supervising the advice you give? What's the fine print that needs to be on the website? That's you know, all about being a better professional and transparency of fees disclosed, disclosed up front. Uh, October 3rd, Kim Kardashian just got fined $1.2 million for non-disclosing the fact she was paid by a crypto company to, to you know, basically send out a message about them. Mm. 
that could have been taken, you know, dealt with up front had she disclosed that. So I think the credibility side of it is, is if you want to be a, a professional in the eyes of how the government will view you and how they view the regulated channel, there's things that are pretty clearly you can do now. Go out and get your certified financial planner designation if you don't already have it, if you want to give any kind of financial advice. Um, I think on the liability side, similarly, I would be so darn worried if I was doing this without the systems I have around me of supervision, of, of pre-approvals, of, of checkups and, and insurance, that if someone sued me because I told them to do the wrong thing on financial advice, they're going to take my house. And I think that's just good for you know, the influencers to protect themselves. But I think it'll also help the credibility of the whole industry. And it is playing a darn good role. Like my daughters who came through high school in the last five years got a few hours of financial education, that's it. Uh, they don't want to deal with dad. They want to be independent. They're also a little you know, concerned and scared about it, right? Because it's intimidating stuff to sit with a guy in a suit who's old and talk personal finance. <laughs> so you know, it's absolutely serving a need to you know, increase the education in the marketplace on basic personal financial topics. All ages should really adopt that, but let's be careful what we offer. Okay, let's hear from Kaval on this. What do you say? Um, I would definitely have to agree with Kurt. Where where the concern lies on is how specific is that financial advice going to be, and are our finfluencers adequately, you know, discussing the risks? that are associated, especially if you're looking at specific investment advice. I've researched some of these finfluencers and you can see anything from a general range of, you know, advice giving what is a registered retirement savings plan? What is a tax-free savings plan? How do you find your contribution limits? That's fantastic advice. That's stuff that people may not be aware of and directing them to the appropriate websites to find that is fantastic. Where the concern is, and I'm sure Kurt can echo this, is when you start seeing very specific discussions around certain investments, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's specific stocks, ETFs, that side of things. And there's no discussion on the risk of investing in those. And there's no direction to go seek professional advice because just because it's working for that Finfluencer doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for, um, you know, that Canadian who's watching that video at that time. And so that's, you know, what really worries me is we're talking about people's finance. And if they make the wrong investment decision based on a general piece of advice that's out there on TikTok or Facebook, it could be very devastating to them. Okay, you just mentioned an acronym, and this is an acronym-free zone. So we're going to say <laughs> ETFs, Exchange Traded Funds, just so yeah. everybody knows what that is. Okay, Siobhan, let me get you back in here. You've heard some of the concerns. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say? I think everything that they've said is completely fair, and I think it's something that both my co-founder and I take very seriously uh, and I think when you decide to have a business online you take a sense of responsibility for what content you are putting out and I expect to also be given that same responsibility from other types of legislation or institutions so for example if I'm putting out content that goes just over the line of that financial advice I expect that to be taken down or at least, you know, being flagged. And what Caval was saying in terms of that foundational level up until they start to have that advice conversation is really where Hiver Academy fits in perfectly. So we are getting people that foundational financial literacy, that inspiration, that information. And then when they're ready to take that next step, when they, you know, graduated from that foundational basis, then they move on to the discussions with financial planners and financial advisors and people that have that expertise, that credibility, um, to be able to direct their futures, because we're just trying to have people get that confidence first. Jim, what do you say to these concerns? 100% agree. So all my social media platforms say it's education, not advice. You need to consult a financial advisor. No matter what idea you get from social media, I don't care what it is, stocks, bonds, crypto, real estate, you need to consult with your financial advisor and not take action on advice that you're hearing from social media. So 100%, you should treat it as education, not advice. We have some info as it regards to that. And to that end, Sheldon, I'm going to ask you if you would to bring this up. This is the bottom of page three. Uh, Australia penalizes unlicensed financial services. Uh, earlier this year, the Australian government introduced new laws cracking down on creators offering financial advice without a federally issued license. Influencers can now be imprisoned for committing offenses such as profiting from affiliate links that direct followers to online brokers, providing opinions that a positive return is a 
guaranteed on a class of products, for example, those ETFs we talked about, exchange-traded funds, sharing with their followers long-term stocks and suggesting they buy and hold them, etc. Okay, this, I guess, raises a question. Why don't we hear, Kurt, uh, from you first on this. Should we do this here? So the regulation is coming on the whole online you know, education, Finfluencer marketplace. Australia's led the way for a couple of years now, included in the regulation of their licensed financial advisor marketplace. UK, USA, Canada is a bit slower on this. And I think part of what's also good to appreciate is even in the regulated licensed world I'm operating in, mortgages are licensed and regulated different than insurance, which is licensed and regulated different than investment products. Within investment products, there's different licenses, different regulations, different requirements. And in the middle is general financial advice that's largely unregulated. So if you want to talk about goals and cash flow and saving for retirement, really, even in the regulated world, not a lot of people supervising or watching over that. So it, it's even more complicated because it depends on, in Canada, what type of advice you're giving. They're all in different pages. The provinces are even different to some degree. Um, but regulation's coming because even in the license channel, you know, something just came out a few months ago where they're now looking at titles of financial advisors in Ontario. So what I put on my business card, you know, next up's gonna be credentials. What are all those credentials mean? I've got eight credentials. Hmm. And if one of them was fake on my business card, you'd never know. Hmm. They're not, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you'd never know. So there's a lot of work to do both in the regulated channel and this is just added in, it's coming too. So if you wanna get ahead of it, you know, cause they can literally shut you down if you, if you don't hmm. kind of follow these rules over time. Kaval, let's hear from you on this. Uh, is this coming to Canada and should it? Uh, I think it's definitely on its way. Like Kurt mentioned, Australia is, is a leader in that they've regulated titles for who can call themselves a financial planner or financial advisor for, for a few years now. And, and Canada is in the process of doing that, which is fantastic. Um, definitely agree. And I do believe that there needs to be some regulation, at least in terms of, you know, like we said, what kind of disclaimers are you putting on your online video to indicate, you know, I'm being paid by such and such company um, to recommend this product to you, or again, you know, making this investment recommendation because it worked for me, but it's not actually advice. Please go do your own research and talk to your financial advisor. So I definitely think it's on its way, and I think it's a good thing. Jim, what say you? I totally agree. So I think if you're giving advice on social media that seems questionable. Like it's not education, it's not inspiration, it kind of borders, like you're talking about a stock, you're talking about a ETF, you should make a disclaimer very clear to say that this is not advice, you should consult your financial advisor or some kind of disclaimer like that for sure. I put that everywhere on my social media channels and it's, and it's important, but the fact is 99% of, of people on TikTok, on the new platforms, they don't worry about that stuff and they and that's a that's a big problem. So one of the benefits of social media is that you get a lot of access to information. But 99% of that information, I would say, is harmful. <laughs> Do you, Siobhan, you want the government regulating what you put up on your website? I think it should be regulated if it's in the best interest of the people. Because I think within each of our different businesses, people are at the heart of it and we're trying to help them. And so if institutions and companies like TikTok and Instagram can also take responsibility for ensuring that we are doing the best we can um, and <laughs> legally, then I think that's a great step to helping us all make sure that we have a level of discernment when it comes to consuming social media. Hmm. Okay, let's, um, let's do, you know, Jim, I wanna talk to you about Logan Paul. I gotta confess, I didn't know who Logan Paul was before doing this. The so-called mega influencer, Logan Paul. You guys all know who he is? Yes, sort of. You all know who he is, okay. All right, anyway, he promoted some obscure cryptocurrency called Dink Doink. You ever heard of this? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Am I like totally out of it here? Am yeah, I a little too? bit, a little bit. Okay, Dink Doink, I hadn't heard of before doing the research for this. He's got six million followers and he's promoting it to them, but he didn't disclose, apropos of what you said about uh, Kardashian, didn't disclose an important conflict of interest. He was friends with the creator of the crypto coin, and they'd come up with this idea together, and then the, pl the price of Dink Doink plummets, and he finds himself in hot water. So the question, okay, Jim, come on in this. How common is bad cryptocurrency advice in the Finfluencer world? 
I think is rampant. Like last year when I was on TikTok, almost everything in my feed was on promoting a coin or promoting an NFT or promoting something related to NFT, cryptocurrency. That's another one. Hang on, I think Sorry. I might know this one. Non-fungible token. token? Okay, correct. So that was everywhere. And the, it was really bad advice. It was very damaging. But the, the voice and the interest and the hype around it was so big, it was almost inevitable that no one, including regulators, could keep up with it, and a lot of people got hurt. And it's it's a danger. That's ex exactly why it's dangerous to listen to social media when it comes to different asset classes and and treating it like advice. Having said that, uh, Kurt, would you acknowledge there is some subjectivity to advice given, even by more established players like you at Manulife, for example? You do have to be uh, aware of the fact that the advice you're giving is. Your opinion. Absolutely. There's a framework of questioning and profile building. There's a range of securities you can offer that aren't suitable for everybody. You got to factor in fees and fee transparencies, fee levels, tax sensitivity, risk tolerance, the purpose of the of the account goals and all that. So for sure, this is not a science. It's an art to some degree within a framework that regulators have defined to make sure we keep people out of the ditch uh, and manage the liability and make sure they reach their goals. Kavel, how about you on that? Uh, any concerns about this? I mean, this is a subjective business based on facts, but it's a subjective business at the end of the day, isn't it? Absolutely. And and just like Kurt said, there are our regulators have, you know, very specific risk questionnaires that we have to ask our, um, our investors to determine suitability. And it's not just how much risk are they willing to take. It has to do with taking a look at their net worth. How much cash flow do they have? How much liquidity? If they were in an emergency situation, is this the only investment that they have and would they need to draw on it? And, you know, being very clear with our investors on the the true volatility and nature of that investment is key. And sometimes we will tell them that we're not comfortable selling that investment to them. And I have actually refused because it is also my business on the line. And I don't want to make a recommendation that I believe is unsuitable based on their circumstances. And that would lead them then to, do, you know, possibly go to a discount online brokerage and, and purchase it themselves. Okay. But uh, ultimately, we do a very in-depth look into our clients and what's suitable for them before we make that recommendation. Now, Siobhan, I, I get, I'm told that uh, some platforms are trying to be more aware when there is either malicious or quite obviously uh, unhelpful content on their financial advice sites and they're trying to take it down. Mm -hmm. And I gather TikTok, they're actually using artificial intelligence to help them discern what's appropriate and what's not, uh, you know, what's unsafe, et cetera. Uh, any of your videos, have you had any of them pulled down by any platforms? Luckily, we have a 100% live rate. We haven't had any videos taken down. We have other people in our network that have gone through that. And I think because of the nature of what we do and focusing on the foundational basic principles of financial literacy, we have a safer space that we can create content in. But I definitely recognize the risks like um, both Kurt and Cabal are talking about in terms of that discussion and those blurred lines and that content should be flagged. And if you feel as an influencer that it still deserves to be public, then we can uh, dispute that and recommend that they review it. So it gives us an opportunity to go back, but I think it it's, uh, saves the people first. So. Can you give us some hints on what to look for on the difference between what would be sort of reputable, trustworthy uh, information on your mm -hmm. site versus, not on yours, but on, say, other sites yeah. that are, you know, clearly over the line? Yeah, I like to think of it as aspirational versus inspirational influencers. If you're following people that you feel that pressure and that urge to be like them or to have what they have, then I encourage you to take a step back and sort of filter through your social media and make sure that you're following people that inspire to be the best version of yourself and make you feel like there is no pressure, there is no urgency because there's nothing quick about building wealth <laughs> as perhaps everyone can agree to. And so I think if there is that pressure, that urgency, um, take a step back and find someone that makes you feel like you have the time, uh, the energy and the confidence to look into it at your own pace. So Kaval, if, if I'm on a website and I see somebody dripping in jewelry with fancy cars and so on, maybe I should just <laughs> maybe maybe take a pause on listening carefully to that stuff? <laughs> 
Um, I mean, with with any ad- online advice, right? Um, I think Jim, Siobhan, Kurt, we've we've all said the same thing. It, it's it's about doing your own due diligence and research after. Um, you know, red flags to look out for. Are they recommending specific products? Have they disclosed whether or not they're receiving financial gain from that? I mean, the Kim Kardashian, uh, Paul Logan examples are are prime uh, examples of that. And and so it's not necessarily you know because they've they've got a diamond ring you don't want to listen to them, but using that as your first stepping stone to then look at some additional advice um, and take that um, you know, information that you receive, take it to your, your planner or your advisor, discuss what you've seen and talk about, uh, you know, extending that education, see what they can teach you about giving, uh, you know, whether or not that's a suitable product for you or a suitable even investment recommendation or savings plan. We've got just a few minutes left here and let's do, Sheldon, how about top of page two here? Let's do one more graphic. Who's watching this stuff? Who consumes financial content online? You will not be surprised to hear 33% of Canadian Gen, either Zers or Zers, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and 22% of millennials refer to financial influencers and social media for their investment decisions. In comparison, just 7% of Canadians over the age of 55 rely on these sources. That, according to a survey by Polera Strategic Insights, it was done for the Bank of Montreal results released in April of this year. Uh, okay, Kurt, uh, there's no surprise in those numbers, is there? No, because you're, you're coming out of high school with no financial education. Uh, you're, you're intimidated, you're concerned, you're stepping into jobs, you've got no idea what to do. And between about 25 and 35 years old, some of your life's biggest events happen. You're going to get a job you hope you have 40 years. You're going to sign up for a mortgage, the biggest debt of your life. You're you may get married, have children, and there's no one to turn to for financial advice. You want to start to push away from your parents. Maybe they're not the most financially literate either. And so, you know, general education, the comfort and convenience of social media is there to kind of fill the void. The challenge, though, and the difference, I think, between a 30-year-old and a 55-year-old is experience, is that they've now, you know, learned. They've been burnt a few times over 25 years. They do look for the fine print. They look for the credibilities, the designation. They know when to turn to experts when, when they need it. So I think that it's just a learning experience. And as long as we can guide the young folks to make sure they know the difference between real and fake, they'll be fine, too. Jim, do you know the demographics of the people who are on your site? Yeah, it's very interesting. TikTok actually does give analytics, and it seems like even though TikTok itself skews younger to like, you know, 10, 12 year old, the people that are following me seem to be 25 to 55. It's a big range. Mm -hmm. A large part of them come from America, and with the 5 million views, they skew about 45% women, 55% men. So it's a very interesting demographic. It's not as young as you would think from the platform. Hmm. Siobhan, how about you? Do you know? Yeah, we started at about 100% uh, female. Great, and we netted Which makes out. sense, because that's who you were aiming at Yeah, anyway. that's where we aimed at. And then we realized a few months in that we ended up at a 70-30. So 70% female, 30% male. Hmm. If you are targeting women, why do you think 30% of your viewership is men? I think because, like Kurt has said, financial literacy is beyond those um, analytics that TikTok gives us. Everybody needs it. And so we've tried to develop the language that you use to be more accessible and approachable for everybody. Hmm. Kaval, in your experience, do you think the Gen Zs, Gen Zs, the millennials, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that you thought you were an elder millennial. I'm not sure there's anything <laughs> elder about you, but anyway. Do you think they are more money anxious or financial services anxious than previous generations? Um, we've definitely seen that, yes, um, you know, about 45% of millennials and Gen Z, according to the uh, FP Canada, Financial Planners Canada's Financial Stress Index, indicate that money is a stressor that is leading to negative mental health. Um, what we are finding is, you know, in that data where you indicated, you know, about 33% of Gen Z is getting it from TikTok, you know, um, Facebook, we are also seeing that about 47% percent are still going to a trusted advisor. So I think it's, which is more significant than some of our older uh, generation. So I think that the Finfluencers are doing a good job of creating that, filling that void to get them to that next step to talk to a financial advisor. Um, and what we've seen from the financial stress index is that more than half of people who use a financial advisor or have a financial plan 
feel less financial stress. So it's relieving that anxiety because they have a plan. They can see their progress. You know, in times like right now where we're experiencing high inflation and, you know, significant market volatility, being able to look at your plan and seeing that you're still making progress helps lift that weight off of your shoulder. And I think that's a definite uh, benefit to working with a planner. Last word goes to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan today. Caval Olson LePage, we thank you for joining us on the line from out west. Kurt Rosentreder is here for Manulife Securities and our friends on the other side of the table, Siobhan Llewellyn and Jim Chong from Hiver Academy and Fat Fire Club, respectively. It's great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank thanks you. for having us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.